everyone. Welcome to the new season of the Theory from the Margins lecture series. I am Marve Tabor and I'll be moderating today's session. Uh, we are delighted to announce an exciting series of lectures for the upcoming year. Our next event will be a lecture by Banu Sabramanyan, Professor of Women, Gender and Sexuality Studies at the University of Massachusetts Amherst on October 18th. Please keep an eye on our website and our Facebook page for further details. Um, before we move on to introducing our speaker uh, for today, I would like to say a few introductory words about who we are and what we do as Theory from the Margins group. Uh, the Theory from the Margins Collective deep reads on current scholarship on postcolonial theory, the decolonial turn, and theory building from the global south. The collective reads works for marginalized communities in the global north and south, as well as critical interventions based on in-depth studies of marginalized groups. Three from the margins is primarily interested in the contemporary global academics engagement with what we understand to be theory, and it aims to spark broader discussions about theoretical concepts outside of academia. I am, I am Arvita Tabor, and I'm at the Department of Cultural Studies and Oriental Languages at the University of Oslo. And today I am joined here by my colleagues, Patrick Brock, who is also from the Department of Culture Studies and Oriental Languages at the University of Oslo, and Theang Theron uh, from the Department of the Study of Religion at MF Norwegian School of Theology, Religion and Society. Um, the structure of today's events will be a lecture by our speaker, followed by questions by the panelists and the audience. If you have any questions, please write them in the Q&A box. And without further ado, I now leave the floor to Patrick to introduce today's speaker. Thank you very much, Merve. Um, I'm Patrick Brock. I'm a research fellow at the University of Oslo and a member of Cook Futures. And I'd like to say that I first came in contact with Rodrigo's work while searching for new approaches to political theory that were originating from the global south. I was immediately struck by the originality of his ideas and their clarity and density, and above all, by their evident desire to actually do something amid the stagnation of possibilities imposed by the reigning yet deteriorating notion that there's no alternative. Both as a doctoral researcher at the Goldsmiths College at the University of London, and as a professor at the Pontifical Catholic University of Rio, and as a political organizer himself, Rodrigo has carefully honed a highly original mode of thinking that both summarizes and surpasses past theories of leftist political organization. Last year's publication of Neither Hor Vertical Nor Horizontal by Versal Books of London heralded the first fruits of that process as a new typology of political organization that reopens the horizon of possibilities in our network era by proposing an ecological way of considering the real importance of organization. We can call it uh, network Leninism or rhizomatic anarchism, whatever you do but pay attention to what this man is saying. And with that, I give the floor to our guest. We'll conduct a 20 minute lecture about his ideas. Rodrigo, the floor is yours. Well, thank you very much, Patrick, for the very kind introduction. And thank you and Merv and Thiang for the, the invitation. It's um, a pleasure to be here with you today. Um, so um, I didn't. I don't know that I can live up to everything that Patrick has just said about um, my my work on uh, political organization, but I'll try. Um, and basically, my idea for this lecture would be to give uh, people who maybe haven't yet come across uh, with the book or have come across uh, the book but haven't read it yet. A general idea of what the intervention that I'm trying to make is uh, with neither vertical nor horizontal. So basically, my idea with the book was uh, to uh, produce an intervention that could work or that worked on four different levels. The first one is obviously uh, theoretical. I mean, the subtitle of the book says it's a theory of political organization. 
uh, which was something that in the process of thinking about these questions, I realized didn't actually exist, at least not in the terms in which uh, I thought such a theory uh, should, uh, it's something uh, would count as being a theory of political organization. So that was something I was trying to do by borrowing from several sources, uh, from thermodynamics to cybernetics to network theory to information theory, um, the philosophy of uh, Spinoza and uh, Gilbert Simondon, um, the tectology of Alexander Bogdanov, uh, post post structuralism, the experience of the ecclesial based communities of uh, liberation theology in Brazil and Latin America, so on and so forth. Um, I tend to describe my goal with this uh, theoretical intervention as um, trying to write a new operational system in which old questions like leadership, scale, discipline, uh, the, the opposition of verticality and horizontality and so on, many of which had been thrown aside uh, as being suspect or as being no longer necessary, but kept coming back as problems that people just couldn't do away with in their political practice. I was, so I was trying to write a new operational system in which these old ideas could run, but could run again, but on a different basis, uh, which would allow us to understand what was still relevant about them and why they kept coming back, why we can do away with them, uh, but at the same time could uh, allow us to think through these questions without some of the baggage that they had acquired, that they had accrued over the years. Um, and I, I usually describe the method uh, with which I was, uh, that I was using to develop this theoretical intervention as being one of moving uh, between downstream and upstream. So from practical problems, from problems that would emerge in uh, very practical contexts, I would work my way back to, you know, what's, what's the, the conceptual problem that generates this practical difficulty? Or what's the theoretical decision that we made back there that led us to this dead end. And so I would move back upstream uh, towards theory or towards conceptual questions to try and solve these conceptual questions and then come back to those practical problems uh, with new eyes or maybe having uh, dissolved those practical problems or having made them appear in a different way. So that would be the theoretical level of intervention. The second level of intervention is historical. And the, the broader historical arc that the, that the book is covering is one that goes from the birth of the idea of revolution at the start of the modern age through its, uh, the transformations that this idea has undergone uh, in the 20th century up until the period that extends uh, approximately from the late 70s or from the 80s until the present, and which I suggest in, in the book is maybe a time that it is in some aspects coming to an end now in our present. But there's also a shorter historical arc in the book. Uh, and this takes us to the third level of intervention, which is more properly speaking, conjunctural. Um, another way of reading the book, another thing that I'm trying to do with the book is basically to draw a balance sheet of the experiences of the last decade, of the decade that started with uh, the Arab Spring and the, the other uh, protest movements that followed in its wake, the protest cycle that opened up in 2011 with the Arab Spring, and then everything that happened in the meantime, the move towards or the turn towards 
electoral politics in in some countries coming out of those movements, but also the rise of the far right in the latter half uh, of the decade. Um, I'm I was thinking about these questions and working on the book for a good chunk of the last decade. So I could actually see those things happening in, in real time and respond to them. And uh, for a book that was pretty much coming out um, at the, uh, around the, the 10th anniversary of those uh, events to try and come up with an answer to the question, okay, so what have we learned in, in, the, in these last, 10 years. Um, and I'm thinking about this period in particular, because even though I'm drawing from a much longer history of uh, anti-systemic movements, uh, it's mostly to these experiences that I'm speaking, because it's mostly this public uh, that I believe I'm addressing. It's mostly people who've been through uh, these experiences, or at least have heard about them, have been inspired by them. And it's this conjuncture, i.e. the political conjuncture uh, that was that opened up in 2008 with the financial crisis and has been developing conti continuously ever since. Um, it is in this conjuncture that I am intervening, hence why uh, this more immediate reference. Um, but there's also a broader uh, or a longer conjuncture that I'm that I've already alluded to that I'm uh, that I'm addressing and that I believe uh, to be intervening in, um, and this takes us to the fourth level of intervention, we, which we could describe as a um, clinical or a, a therapeutic intervention in a certain uh, conjuncture. Um, this is where uh, I'm, I'm addressing specifically what I have just called a, a politico-theoretical conjuncture that opens up in the late 70s or in the 80s um, and whose uh, decline I identify in the present and I'm very uh, whose end I'm very consciously trying to hasten with this book. So what, what am I referring to here? And what, what, is, what is it that um, my, my clinical intervention is trying to address? The first thing is what I identify at the start of the book as something I call uh, the trauma of organization that is characteristic of this period, starting in the late 70s, perhaps even earlier, but which really becomes consolidated from the late 70s until now. Um, by, by which I mean the trauma of the experiences of emancipatory projects uh, at scale in the 20th century. Uh, not only the defeats of uh, attempts to um, mobilize the collective capacity to act uh, of workers, of subaltern groups, uh, et cetera, in an anti-systemic direction, but even more bitterly, the experience of seeing several movements that had set out to produce liberation, to produce emancipation, that had not only failed to overcome uh, capitalism as a world system or failed to overcome systems of oppression, but ended up producing different forms of oppression themselves. Um, so this left people in the situation in which they knew to what extent organized collective power could be perverted, which is why not unreasonably, uh, many people, most of us wish to refuse or minimize the role that uh, organized collective agency should play. Um, you know, the question, the, the big question of the 90s, uh, the question of whether it, it was possible to change the world without taking power, is a question that only arose from the historical experience of taking power and failing to change the world. So this 
this was uh, the, this sets the scene for this trauma that I'm referring to. Um, and basically what I'm calling the trauma of organization um, does is it opens our eyes to the fact that organization can be a danger in excess uh, because it can turn the means which we give ourselves to express our collective capacity to act against that capacity. Uh, and it, become, it can become an instrument of oppression, of exploitation, et cetera, et cetera in its own right. The problem is um, by making us think of organization exclusively in terms of excess, it blinds us to the fact that the lack of organization is also a problem. The lack of organization, the lack of means of expressing our collective capacity to act is a problem to the extent that it entails impotence, the incapacity to change the situations in which we find ourselves in. Um, so basically what the trauma of organization does is it blinds us to what I call in the book, the pharmacological nature of organization, i.e. the fact that it is a risk, it is a danger, it is a poison, um, but if we understand organization to be uh, the means we give ourselves in order to enhance our collective capacity to act, then organization is also, uh, is not only a risk, is not only a danger, is not only uh, a poison, but it's also a remedy. It's also a condition of possibility, an enabling condition, and therefore a necessity uh, if we are to be capable of transforming the things around us. So to say that organization is pharma pharmacological um, is to say that there is no escaping this problem. The very thing we need, the very thing we require in order to act is also the thing that threatens us. And that's just what it is. That's just the nature of the problem we have to deal with. There are no magical solutions. There is no good power versus bad power. Uh, there are no forms of organization that would be free from risks, but there's also no doing away with the question of organization either. Um, there's three consequences that follow from this trauma. Uh, the identification between organization and a few specific forms of organization, especially those associated with the defeats of the 20th century, um, from the idea that organize, organization applies only to certain forms and not others, particularly the party, of course, which is the main organizational form that's associated with those defeats, with those traumas of the 20th century. Um, from this idea, then, the idea that organization is something that must be rejected altogether. Organization is the enemy. It is always the Leviathan, as uh, the Invisible Collective have recently written which I take, I take that phrase, organization is always the Leviathan, as the very expression of the trauma that I'm talking about. You can only see it as a danger. You cannot see it as an enabling condition. Uh, and finally, what follows is that um, since, since the organizational forms that aren't considered to be organization, aren't considered to be dangerous, that aren't considered to be the Leviathan appear as only viable at a certain scale, uh, it follows that one must only act locally at the small scale. One would rather be powerless to a fact that which exists and conditions us at a higher scale than run the risk of trying to act at that scale and having our action and having our power turn against us. Uh, Something that's symptomatic of this moment, that of this political theoretical conjuncture that I'm referring to, uh, is precisely the way in which the vocabulary of local resistances replaces the vocabulary of both revolution and reform, uh, and also a certain reception of scientific discourses on self-organization, which I criticize and I counter in the book because basically the way in which people were incorporating scientific discourses on self-organization into political discourse uh, was 
such that it eliminated everything that had to do with scale um, and uh, it had a tendency to look at social systems from the perspective of an outside observer as if we weren't as if we aren't inside the social systems that we discuss acting on limited information within within them so i i try i describe one of the things that i'm trying to do is providing in the book as providing an account of self organized organization as seen from the inside precisely to counter that tendency how am i doing for time I forgot to check at the start what time it was you still have four minutes um the second thing that i was uh trying to intervene on is um um is something I call uh, the double melancholia of the left. The concept of left melancholia has become very popular in recent years. Uh, melancholia here is obviously taken from uh, Freudian theory in which it's understood as the incapacity uh, to overcome the loss of an object. And I'm suggesting in, in the book that we should, con we should consider there are actually two different uh, kinds of uh, melancholias in the left. Uh, today, arising from the defeat of the two major models um, of social change in the imaginary of the 20th century left, which I identify with 1917, the Russian Revolution on the one hand, and 1968, um, but obviously not only 1968, the movements of the 60s and 70s on the other hand. And the problem here is that because these two um these two models define themselves in opposition to one another or the people who identify with these two models define themselves in opposition to one another um and since because this means that to revise one's commitments uh would amount to giving in to the other side these two sides are locked in an incapacity to examine the shortcomings of their open own positions, i.e. they're locked precisely in an incapacity to mourn the loss, the defeat uh, of these two models. And the consequence is that it's as if each side holds one piece or one side of the ph pharmacological continuum of organization that I've just described between no organization at all and too much organization, which both prevents the problem of organization from being posed as it should and explain why so many debates in recent decades have have appeared or have been posed as a matter of choosing a side in a set of opposing conceptual pairs so you, you have to choose between either micro or macro politics either autonomy or hegemony either um decentralization or coordination so on and so forth and with this intervention i was trying to show uh, at once how this unproductive way of posing the problem has historically emerged out of what conditions it has become impossible to to uh, pose the problem of organization properly but also to uncover what this unproductive way of posing the problem prevents us from seeing uh, i.e. what I would ar argue is the true nature of the problem of organization. Um, so there is a negative work to be done on the one hand to try and unmake these traumas, this melancholia, and the impossibility in posing the problem of organization that they create on the one hand, but also a positive work of um, laying out a different way a different language in which to think through these questions, um, a different a different way of um, posing the problem of organization. And this is where the positive work of the theoretical intervention comes in. Um, there would be more to say on what exactly uh, this positive work uh, does, but um, hopefully we'll get to to explore some of these uh ideas in the 
in the conversation. Um, I'll stop here so we have time for, for the questions and the debate. Thank you for this thought-provoking and insightful talk, Rodrigo. Um, now we will take questions from the panelists. Patrick, you want to go first? Thank you, Mervyn. Yes, I'm going to start with a question that's very dear to our research here at uh, CoFutures. And it has to do with uh, what we call CoFuturists. Um, the last few decades have seen the emergence of transnational movements deploying a combination of aesthetic and political claims. Afrofuturism and indigenous futurism are the most prominent. Sometimes they use science fiction elements Sometimes they yearn to make our notions of temporality more complex or to reclaim the idea of futurity around wider interests. But often they seem to embody what you would call the unintended forms of organization or the molar formations that Deleuze and Guattari spoke of. My question is how can these movements and if whether these movements can expand beyond identitarian and representational claims. Do you think that they can become the seeds of new ways of mobilizing emotions and ideas around the political organization and even as vectors of distribution, distributed action? Thank you very much. Thank you, Patrick, for for the question. I'm actually quite curious to learn more about the this what what you call uh, co-futures because it's a it's a new um, it's a new concept uh, for me that I would like to to learn more about. Um, well I think as you say it, it wouldn't be uh, unfair to say that so far these movements that you're referring to uh, have been mostly or essentially aesthetic rather than political per se, which means several things among, among which uh, the fact that the ways in which they circulate uh, and, um, and organize take place outside what's usually construed as being the political sphere. They take place in the art world, they take place in academia, but not in the political sphere, uh, more strictly, more strictly speaking, which from my perspective is not a problem. One of the things uh, that I, I, I can argue from the basis laid out in the book is that uh, this doesn't in any way prevent them from producing effects that can be political, um, precisely, to the extent that they can mobilize uh, affects, they can inspire attitudes and, uh, uh, and changes of behavior uh, that could accumulate over time to produce uh, large scale changes. Um, what I call um, aggregate action as opposed to collective action more narrowly construed. Um, and as such, I think they no doubt have a very, uh, a very healthy, a very salutary role to play in shaping political imaginaries. I, I, I say it's healthy because uh, I think it's always healthier and more useful to base politics on the idea that whatever we do, uh, whatever actions we, we take, whatever transformation uh, we bring about, will take place in the future, uh, i.e. in a place that for better and worse uh, is the irreversible result of everything that came before, rather than in the prospect of um, a, a return to some idealized past. So I'm, I'm very sympathetic to uh, what the element of futurism, uh, the role that the element of futurism can play here in the sense of um, uh, 
not evidently not forgetting the past, not leaving the past behind, but reading the past against against the grain, as it were, uh, to find the stuff that can be recovered and reinjected in the future, but not you know the the basis on which uh, a return to the past, which is evidently impossible, could take place. And this is, I think, what these movements uh, do. Uh, and in that sense, I think that's very um, healthy. Um, but I think they can also, so far, we could say to the extent that they haven't, um, that, you know, they have no doubt inspired political movements, but they haven't really taken on a political dimension of their own. I think we could also see them as being good testing grounds for what the limits uh, would be of exclusively aggregate action, uh, i.e. the um, action that takes place exclusively at the level of the ch uh, changes in attitudes and behaviors in um, ways of feeling and thinking rather than more concerted collective action to attain collective goals. Um, because the question then uh, becomes, is the goal here to actually change the world or new, merely to introduce new ideas uh, or new images in the existing world? Um, is the goal just to find recognition for these images and ideas and the people who uh, are their bearers? Uh, or is it to actually transform the distribution of wealth and power in line with what these ideas and images suggest? And I think if the latter, then certainly they are going to need to develop uh, a more uh, explicitly collective dimension as well at some point or the movements that are taking them on the movements that are inspired by these uh, aesthetic tendencies will need to uh, take on a more uh, concerted collective dimension to attain those goals basically basically it's a matter of and this is where we could draw a line between uh, more the more aesthetic and the more the more strictly speaking political um, sides of the equation on the political side of the of the equation there is a greater uh, a greater concern with the with the consequences of, of with organizing the consequences of what you're doing uh, of, of what you're saying and, and thinking. It's not simply about throwing ideas into the world, but actually turning these ideas into motor forces for transformation. Um, if, if this passage takes place, then I think it's inevitable that these movements will take on these, let's say more aesthetic movements or tendencies will take on a more uh, overtly uh, political um, collective dimension. And this is where my book would come in. Thank you very much. If Murphy would allow me just a quick segue, we are, we do are seeing a record number of Afro-Brazilians and indigenous peoples running for office in this year's election in Brazil. Do you think that could be one, the start, the beginnings of this, this moving on to more traditional political organizations from from these claims is that it's their claim sure yeah i mean that's definitely um it's it's always dangerous to to um there's always a danger that you know we end up reducing politics to what gains institutional expression and then saying oh now we're seeing it because we can see it in in institutions but obviously it's very important that this is taking on uh, an institutional dimension as well. And this is a very, a very significant change 
in in Brazil in you know just the space of one decade we didn't have anything like this level of uh, uh, participation and occupation of institutional politics by black and indigenous people just 10 years ago this is a massive change and a massive change that's uh, that's not happening on its own precisely it's happening because um, there's been a lot more uh, collective political action not only within institutions but um, you know in everywhere in in society on the part of these groups in the last years and the most important thing uh, is precisely that more and more they are what what they're posing is not simply uh, recognition uh, for a certain position within society or for a certain identity within society but what they're saying is uh you know we're not here to discuss black issues or we're not here to discuss indigenous issues we're here to discuss brazilian issues we're here to discuss national issues from an indigenous or from a black or from a feminist or fr from a, a an lgbtqi um perspective and that's also a very important shift Thank you very much. I'll go next. So my question concerns your use of the term ecology to conceptualize these complex forces of political relationality beyond the horizontal vertical binary. And uh, you pinpoint climate change and like the difficulty of kind of articulating the local and the global environmental activism at, at the beginning of the book. So, um, my question is, to what extent is your theory of political organization influenced by more natural scientific definitions of ecology and by ecological thought and by environmental activism? And to what extent does ecology serve as a form of analogy or a metaphor in your theory of political organization? Well, the first thing to say there, I mean, this is it's a very good concept and a, a very good question sorry and a, a question i uh i get a lot on on the book which means that the the answer to it is developing uh over time i i see a new part of the puzzle every time i get this question again the first thing to say uh about the the presence of this concept of ecology which is perhaps the most central um concept in the book basically i'm arguing precisely that we need to shift a way of thinking about the question of organization that makes the question of organization hinge on organizations on individual organizations and uh, makes it basically the question um, makes it so basically that the question that the question of organization would be trying to answer would be the question uh, what is the correct organizational form i'm trying to shift that to saying actually organization always with exists within an ecology of different organizations of different organizational forms and it exists uh, outside between and even within these organizations in ways that cannot be reduced to individual organizations and a theory of political organization must be capable of um taking all of that into account and basically this this means that the question of organization ceases ceases to be the question of what is the correct organization form and becomes rather you know how to make the best use of the ecology that we have how to act how to strategize within an existing ecology so on and so forth um so this is very essential to to the book to to the shift in perspective that the book is trying to promote but the one of the first things or the first thing to say about the the use of the concept of ecology in the book is that it is to a good extent a native concept in the sense that increasingly in the last decade um 
movements themselves and people speaking from within movements have started to use this word and refer to the space in which they move as an ecology. This is a shift that's been happening over a decade. I, I would like to think I, I actually, um, with, with my work, I actually helped um, um, promote this shift. But by now, by the time I was writing the book, this was already a native concept among movements. Um, is it a metaphor? Uh, and so it was a native concept that basically one of the things that the book was trying to do was to draw the consequences of this concept. You know, what happens, what are the, what is implicit in our use of this word? Is it a metaphor? Uh, I'm, I would like to think that it isn't. Um, um, maybe we could say it's not a metaphor without it being necessarily literal either. And what I mean by that is that maybe it's analogical in the sense that um, ecology can serve, ecology in the sense uh, in which it is discussed by the natural sciences, um, can serve as a model from which to think relations and dynamics that exist within political ecologies or organizational ecologies. Uh, in other words, I believe it's possible to generalize from what science tells us about natural ecologies, um, some relations and dynamics that can also be observed at work in political ecologies, uh, without it necessarily being the case, of course, that all the relations and dynamics that we find in natural ecologies will be found in political ecologies or vice versa. You know, it's not that, so one thing can function as a model for the other because they share some traits without it being necessarily the case that they share all the traits or without it being the case that one thing can be uh, reduced to the other. You know, to, to pick just a first but far from minor difference, uh, a very important difference in political ecologies or in organizational ecologies in the sense that I'm talking about in the book is that people within those ecologies uh, are aware of belonging to an ecology and are capable of building their own models of that ecology in a way that's not necessarily true of natural ecosystems. So that's just one difference, but it's a very important one. Um, um, so to on, on the question of the, the relationship to the natural sciences, the, the other thing that I should say is that my concept of uh, organization entails that conscious, deliberate organization is um, just a part of organization taken more broadly. One of the perhaps slightly counterintuitive uh, conclusions uh, of the book is that we shouldn't see organization in the sense of conscious, deliberate organization, uh, or we shouldn't see self-organization as being one part of conscious, deliberate organization, but the other way around. Self-organization in the sense of, you know, the self-organization the self of the physical and biological world is the broader realm within which our forms of conscious political uh, organization takes, takes place. And our conscious political organization is therefore informed, conditioned, and limited to some extent uh, by the patterns, the dynamics uh, of self-organization in, in the sense uh, of the physical and uh, biological sciences. Um, so in that sense, the connection to the natural sciences is very important to me in, in the book. Um, which means that I'm not just trying to, as you, as you said, 
the, I keep coming back throughout the book to, to the question of climate change because I think it helps us illuminate several problems uh, and, um, and also gives them a certain sense of urgency that makes it clear that we're not just talking about abstract problems. We're talking about you know, very serious challenges that we need to solve now before it's too late. Um, but so basically this reference, the way I'm conceiving the, the relationship between conscious deliberate organization and self organization and the, the relationship between politics and uh, the natural world as described by the natural sciences um, means that I'm not just thinking how we can political, politically address ecological crisis, but also using ecological thought to inflect how we understand politics. So the, the, the problem is working in both, uh, or the, the, this relationship is working in both directions at once in, in the book uh, and in, in my work more broadly, uh, I would say. Um, but this is definitely, I, I don't think I've done enough in, in the book in terms of exploring the relationship between the concept as it's employed in politics and the concept as it's employed in the natural sciences. And this is definitely one of the areas which I would like to develop further in the future. Thank you for your response, Rodrigo. And now we have Theang's question. Yeah, thank you so much. I was just wondering um, if we have time do you have enough time? Yeah, we do. We do. Yeah. Okay. Uh, Cause I'm, I'm just gonna rush then. Maybe like a quick small question. Yeah. So thank you so much, um, Professor uh, Rodrigo Nunes. I mean, it was very uh, mind opening, and I, I, I am in awe. Like <laughs> right now at this point of time, I just don't know where to begin. But um, I was very much interested in the, I suppose it was the fourth chapter on, uh, I think, critique of self-organization, where I found uh, a lot of things very, um, I wouldn't say universal, but then I found a lot of things which like brought in, uh, yeah, it, it was like a, like a canopy that kind of um, brought in the entire, uh, uh, situation of organization like across world i mean at this point of time i could just um take example of india because i'm from <laughs> india and then thing is like it it is very relevant when you spoke of things like um how hierarchy is also limited and constrained by environment and ecosystem and also about how there is also hierarchy within self organization so i was very um I'm very flustered, like uh, trying to piece these things. And so I wondered like how, um, because as you mentioned that things are very contextual. So how does context play a role in organization? And does it depend on the observer or does it entail the entire process of uh, onlookers who are observing the possible tenets and uh, how, to overcome such inherent power relations. I mean, I don't know if <laughs> I'm being able to formulate, but yeah, thank you. Um, well, thank you. Thank you for your comments and, and the question. Um, I'll start from the end, how to overcome power relations. I guess the answer that the, the book is giving is you just don't, um, not in any absolute way. Uh, this is precisely one of the things that follows from uh, understanding organization in pharmacological ways. The risk will always be there, um, i.e. the risk. So what is, um, you know, people, people, one of, one of the most uh, naive, but also uh, most difficult questions that I've, that I've been asked about the book is, well, the book is called Neither 
vertical, hor not horizontal. So what does that mean? Um, and um, and the answer I, that I could come up with uh, on the spot, if I if I can remember it correctly, now was basically vertical means um, the argument that some kind of um, some kind of uh, disparity in power relations, some kind of power differential has a role to play in movements. You need leadership. You need structures that allow for decisions to be made quickly, which means that you can't have everyone's input at every time, uh, so on and so forth. Whereas horizontal means uh, the idea that you should strive for maximum uh, reciprocity in power relations within um, within any political movement or within you know the society in which we live or the society which we want to build um, neither vertical nor horizontal means precisely holding those two ideas together the thing you need on the one hand is precisely the, the thing you sometimes need is precisely the thing you need to be careful with and uh, the, the thing that you need to uh, keep under control. So basically, instead of precisely, instead of thinking these two as um, binary opposites that you must choose between, uh, either you say, yes, leader, leadership, et cetera, vertical power relations play a very important role. So reciprocity be damned. That's not a problem. Or on the other hand, saying no, reciprocity, you can't, you can't give up on reciprocity, which means that you know, if, if this makes you uh, inefficient, if this makes you incapable of acting or responding to a changing conjuncture, then you know, them's the brakes and that's just the way things are. Holding on, saying neither nor means holding on to both ideas at the same time and saying, well, actually you need both. And which means that instead of going one way or the other, what you have is a spectrum of relations going from absolutely no uh, power differentials, which is impossible, as I argue uh, in the book, and power differentials that are so high that power is almost entirely concentrated in a single point. And then this single point can be very easily, can very easily become uh, a source of oppression, of exploitation, etc. What you need is to, what we need to do collectively is to manage relations within those two poles. So make the most of power differentials to the extent that we might need them. Uh, and I, I argue in the book that there are needs for them. Uh, leadership, if you understand it as a function that needs to be performed within movements rather than uh, a leadership position that you appoint uh, certain people to, to occupy, certainly has a, a role to play. But you must also be aware of the dangers that it carries and you must build the mechanisms through which that can be um that can be controlled um i would say that's probably in a way the answer to the answer that the book is proposing to the question of uh to the question of organization is there is no answer you're not going to solve it once and for all uh, the risks will always be there, and you just have to be aware of them and and deal with them and and roll with it. But at the same time, you can't give up on on uh, what you need to do, on what you want to do, in order to change the conditions you find yourself in, just because there are dangers. You know that's just the way life is. You have to you have to run. There are those risks, but you can try and be more aware of what the risks are 
where exactly they lie and how exactly you can control it. And that's one of the things I'm trying to help with with this book. I think maybe we have time for one more question. No, Patrick, you want to go? I do, I do. I have one question. Um, you, in the book, uh, Rodrigo, you wrote about how far right movements in the US and Brazil have been kind of successful in harnessing these new ways of organization. And uh, you also have written recently about Bolsonarism as a collective identity. And uh, what can we learn, just expanding on what you wrote in the book, what can we learn about uh, political organization from these movements, from Bolsonarism, and from these far right movements in the US and Brazil? And of course, we, we're having a historic election in Brazil this Sunday. And uh, what, can, what could happen to Bolsonarism once the Brazilian president is defeated? One thing I've I've been asked about the book is, do you think your book could be used by the by the far right? And and the answer is, of course, uh, I I obviously I obviously believe that it could. There's nothing that prevents it from being used by the far right. Um, and in a way, if it can be, it's it's a sign that it has some usefulness, even if it's uh, if it means being put to use to users that I don't agree with. And I think one of the things that's remarkable about the, the, the far right now, I've, I've actually just written uh, a text that hasn't come out yet comparing Brazil and to, to a lesser extent the US with the organization of the, the BJP and the RSS in, in India, which is more similar to, uh, to 20th century historical fascism than the, the case of the US and Brazil. And I'm precisely exploring this difference. I think one of the things that the, the far right in, in Brazil and perhaps even more so in the US and for a long time in the US have been very good at exploring is precisely the way in which they organize as an ecology in the US, you have a far right ecology of think tanks of religious groups of uh, influencers uh, of politicians, etc, that go back to the, the 1970s or even further and you know the a, a, re a recent result like the overturning of Roe versus Wade in in the US is not something that happened now is actually something that's been it's a game that's been being being played for a very long time if you if you look at it um, at the same time there's um there's there are things we cannot learn with the the far right or we should not learn with the far right because i think a, an important difference uh, between the far right and us broadly construed um, is the far right will have absolutely no qualms uh, about using their social base uh, for the interests of the leadership in in such a way that you know this social base can be turned on and off according to the political interests of their leadership they're not really interested in their lead their social base being too organized or too autonomous uh, or too capable of uh, making their own decisions etc in a way that i don't think anyone uh who's fighting for um for uh emancipation in the broadest possible sense could be satisfied with because you know as uh, as Deleuze once said one of the challenges for the left is we need people to think we need people 
to be active uh, in their own terms, to think for themselves, to, to organize, to organize in their own terms uh, and to pursue their own ends. But I think there's one thing specifically, well, not specific to the Brazilian case, actually, this is quite general, but a, a very important lesson uh, that we can learn from the far right in recent years is not so much a um, organizational lesson, lesson as a lesson about what the nature of politics is. Um, you know, for a long time, the, the institutional left uh, pretty much everywhere in the world has always been constrained by this idea of, well, we, sh we should do this and we should do that, but these things aren't realistic. And what meaning that, you know, the conditions for it don't exist, meaning that uh, the, either the objective conditions or the subjective conditions, the support within the population for those things don't exist. And one thing we have learned with the, the far right in the last half decade or however long is that precisely the goal of politics is to change the limits of what's realistic. Um, you know, the, the, the far right has managed very well in the last however many years to make things that were absolutely unthinkable not too long ago become possible for them, become available possibilities for them, or even become normalized. Um, and I think this is a very important question, that the goal of politics is actually to not to act within the limits of what's already possible, not to simply chase what the, the public opinion already thinks, but actually transform those limits, transform uh, people's opinions in the direction that we believe is the direction of the change uh, that we need. And, and this will be a very, hopefully, will be a, a lesson that the, the left, if it does turn out that the left, um, that the left will return to power in Brazil, um, as seems the most likely result at the moment. Uh, hopefully, this will be one lesson that it, it will have learned from the far right, which is a very important lesson, among other things, because, and this, uh, this is to answer the last part of your question, among other things, because the far right isn't going away just because they lose the elections, if they lose the elections. It will remain an active force in Brazilian politics for several years to come. And it will continue to pull the spectrum of political debate in the direction of the right. So if the left is not actively exercising a, 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 a pull in the opposite direction, it's not trying to wrestle the uh, control over the, the agenda from the far right, then it will continue to, to work uh, to, to fight and to argue within uh, a, a debate, the terms of which are being set by the right. So it's absolutely urgent that, um, the, that the next government in, in Brazil actually uh, take to heart this lesson. Uh, if it is going to be able to resist the constant attraction of a permanent, uh, fairly sizable, highly mobilized uh, far-right social base as we, we are likely to have in Brazil for several years to come now. On that note, I think we can wrap it up here. Thank you so much, Rodrigo, and thank you all the panelists and the attendees for joining us today. Um, don't forget, next event is on October 18th. Please follow us on Facebook for further details, and we hope to see you again in our next lecture. Thank you three very much, and thank you everyone who watched. <laughs>